Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to a video review on the ATI Rage 128 Pro. Now, usually when I build a retro gaming computer, my go-to graphics cards are from 3DFX or NVIDIA. However, after having spent some time with this ATI card, I must say I'm mighty impressed. A lot of the issues that you read in the uh, in old reviews seem to have been uh, taken care of with newer drivers. So in this video, what are we going to look at? Lots of benchmarks. We will see how the card compares against competition from uh, NVIDIA 3DFX and also uh, Matrox. We'll have a look at the multimedia capabilities. This card has the Rage Theta chip. You can see it's right here. And that chip is responsible for the card uh, being able to video capture. It's got a composite video input here, but also S-Video and composite uh, video output. We will also have a look at the driver, um, how to install it and what options the driver gives us. So let's go ahead, enjoy this video. Just a few words about the test setup. We've got an A-Open Slot 1 motherboard with the Intel 440BX chipset. Here's the graphics card, the ATI Rage 128 Pro. Sound card is the Soundbluster Audigy LS. I've got a floppy drive connected. Because Windows 98, when you install it, it keeps looking for a floppy drive, so that speeds things up a little bit. A 20 gigabyte IDE hard drive from Western Digital and a DVD drive. We've got 256 megabyte of uh, SD RAM, um, 500 watt power supply, and that's pretty much it. I've got the monitor hooked up, the speakers, wireless keyboard and mouse, and we are good to go. Now the Pentium 3 system is not the system that will actually be used to benchmark. I'll be using a faster Pentium 4 running at 3 GHz, which is part of a larger Windows 98 SE benchmarking project of mine. I'll put the link down below in the description if you want to find out more. So the Pentium 3 system is really to showcase the graphics card, how the driver works, we're going to look at the options and especially all the multimedia, the video in and the video out and all of that. Okay, here we are, just installed Windows 98, ready to install the drivers. There are two pieces of software you need. If you're not interested in the multimedia, the video input and the video output, you don't need to install the multimedia center. You just need the driver and you can get these still from the AMD website. So this is the latest driver for the Rage 128 Pro. So we're just gonna proceed and see what the installation looks like. So yeah, there was a small little hiccup. I had to point the installer to the directory where the driver got unpacked. So if you look um, um, on the C drive under ATI, support, I open this folder, um, setup directory, it needed to be pointed to this folder. Um, not sure why, but that happens sometimes. Alrighty, so let's cross this off. So I'm just gonna change the resolution and the colors. So I'm going to go with 1024 and true color. Let's see if we can do this without rebooting. There you go. And then I'm just going to make this full screen and auto adjust my monitor. If I can figure out how to do it, I think you just have to hold it. There you go. Okay, we're ready to go. And the second piece of software that you need to install if you want to uh, watch DVD movies, if you want to use the video in and the video out uh, functionality, there's also a, a little uh, video editor. So if you want all of that, you need to install the Multimedia Center. Now this software is not on the AMD website anymore. I got this from a good friend who is uh, also a Vogons member. Michael is his name from Germany and he runs a website retron.de and he has his own FTP server where he hosts a lot of hard to find stuff. So I got this from his FTP server. Michael, thank you, helped me out tremendously. So we just go into that folder. There's a setup file here and we're just gonna install all the software. And 
and that's it we've got all the software installed we will have a look at the multimedia stuff uh, later in the video let's have a look at the standard driver options so you right click go to properties and then under settings and then we click on uh, advanced down here and here we have all the options now under displays you can do a couple of monitor tweaks take note that on my machine it defaults to 75 Hertz so if you're doing any capturing or you've got other issues uh, just be aware of that you can change that by going to adapter and changing the refresh rate from optimal to 60 Hertz I'm just gonna do that now and press OK um, once you plug in an external display device this will work and you can configure some TV options here we have color options where you can tweak the brightness um, also a color curve for red green blue and so on but I'm gonna reset that to default options for OpenGL um, what is interesting here is definitely this one uh, waiting for uh, vSync by default is disabled that's pretty good and under direct 3D by default it is enabled so we'll actually have to turn it off later for benchmarking but I'll show you how that works and here's some options to display the tray menu so fairly straightforward but it does have a few advanced features for example you can play around with the bit depths for the set buffer turn on our table fox support and it also supports compressed uh, textures so there are a lot of little things you can tweak in case your game needs it or doesn't work properly okay so I'm just gonna install uh, two games an OpenGL game and I'm just gonna show you that the vSync control works as intended so what we need to do is here is press escape and under video just change the driver to default OpenGL there you go and we can see the FPS counter here um, 84 it's over 80 so definitely vSync is disabled so we're gonna quit the game and just see if we can actually change that setting because the reason I always check this out is a lot of graphics cards it doesn't really work and you have to use third-party utilities so you click on OpenGL and you just tick this box wait for vertical sync apply ok and let's run it again and let's see if the change has been set so it's around 75 here so yeah it looks like that the monitor is um, setting has got a refresh rate of 75 Hertz at 640 by 480 so vSync is definitely engaged in this case okay let's get out of here and let's try the same thing with an open with a direct direct 3d game uh, we've got forsaken here I just had to install the latest patch it wouldn't work otherwise so let's try it again we're gonna play forsaken just a generic 3d accelerator and we should get the FPS counter again so this is at 640 by 480 resolution so we can see it's got an FPS counter of 75 so again it's vSyncing with the 75 Hertz refresh rate so we go back into the uh, ATI driver and we turn vSync off and we have a look what happens and the reason I'm showing you this is because for the direct 3D option, the vSync option to work, you have to restart the computer. So it's still syncing at 75 despite us having changed the setting. So let's do a quick reboot and then we'll see that after the reboot, vSync is now disabled. Okay, just restarted the computer and let's try it again. And we should have vSync disabled now so we should get a frames per second that is significantly higher than 75 there you go 123 FPS so basically for OpenGL it does not require a reboot for you to change the vSync option but for direct 3D 
a reboot is required. Okay, let's have a look at some benchmarks and analyze all the data. Starting with 3D Mark 99 Max, the ATI card struggles a little bit. It's on the level of a Voodoo 3 2000. Moving on to 3D Mark 2000, um, not much has changed. It's actually now slower than the Voodoo 3 2000. Um, uh, still ahead of the TNT M64, but that is quite a slow card to be honest. Okay, 3D Mark 2001 SE. Now this benchmark uses 32-bit colors and we can see that the situation is changing and that's a theme um, you'll see throughout the benchmarks. It is now right on the heels of the TNT 2 which is actually pretty cool. I don't have a standard TNT uh, in these charts yet. Okay, Earth 2150. Now uh, I have to say this game does not like the Nvidia cards. It performs a lot better on the Matrox and the Voodoo cards. Now, pay special attention to the two colors, the orange one and the gray one. The orange one is 1024 by 768 in 16 bits and the gray one is 1024 by 768 in 32 colors. And if you look at the ATI card, you can see that the gray bar is not far behind the orange bar. Whereas if you look at the Nvidia and the Matrox cards, the gap is much larger. So this means that the ATI card gives you 32-bit color quality with a minimal loss in performance. You basically get almost the same speed as if you played in 16-bit colors. Whereas the other cards will actually perform significantly faster in 16-bit colors. So here in 32-bit colors, it's, it's even ahead of the uh, TNT 2 Ultra. But just in this benchmark. In Expandable, we can see the same trend, very uh, the closeness between 16 and 32 bit colors, and once again, very competitive with the uh, compared to the TNT cards. Uh, Dragon, also very good uh, frame rates on the level, let's say in 32 bit colors, it's on the level of a TNT 2 Pro. In 16-bit, it's a little bit behind. Okay, let's have a look at OpenGL performance, and there's a lot of uh, information on OpenGL, and supposedly the ATI is not doing well. But these numbers look pretty good. So in Quake 2, we're getting uh, 54.7 frames at 1024 by 768 in 32-bit colors, which is ahead of the TNT 2 Pro and Pretty, in, pretty much on the level of a Matrox G400, which is a very good 32-bit color card as well. Quake 3, we can once again see how close 16-bit and 32-bit color performance is. Um, it's on the level of a standard TNT 2. In MDK 2, in 32-bit colors, it's ahead of the TNT 2 Pro and also ahead of the Matrox G400. If you're wondering about the Voodoo cards, they cannot render in 32-bit colors. That's why I think you can only see the bars for 16-bit colors. This is an interesting chart. I've added up all the FPS scores for 16 bits, and we can see that in 16 bits, the card is roughly on the level of a TNT 2. But do note that the uh, Earth 20, the Earth benchmark skews the result a little bit. Basically. In 16-bit colors, the card is one of the weaker ones. However, that situation changes totally if you're playing in 32-bit colors. It is extremely competitive. It's right up there with the TNT 2 Pro and the Ultra. Um, only the Matrox cards are a little bit ahead. They, uh, the Matrox cards are really good at 32-bit colors. And looking at uh, the combined overall score, we can see that the Rage 128 Pro is very competitive neck and neck with the TNT2 a little bit ahead, uh, somewhat behind the G400 cards, but because the Voodoo cards can't do 32-bit colors, it also uh, is ahead of those. So overall, a really solid performance, and the way we can sum it up is 16-bit performance is 
um, low compared to the competition from 3DFX and NVIDIA, but as soon as you play in 32-bit colors, the situation changes and the Rage 128 Pro is actually a really, really good card and there is no reason for you not choosing the Rage 128 Pro compared to NVIDIA or 3DFX or Matrox. Depending on the model of Rage 128 Pro, you might have some multimedia video inputs and outputs. Thanks to the Rage Theatre chip, which is uh, right on here, this card has S-Video as well as composite output and it's got a composite input. So we're going to have a look at these options now. I'm using a USB video capture device, it's the EasyCap. Um, just be aware there are a lot of fake, fake ones, so if you do buy one of these, get it from the easycap.tv website. So the software is running, so we're just going to turn on the machine. What is good is that the outputs will work without the monitor plugged in as a main output device. So this could come in handy if you're into emulation, for example, you want to run uh, MAME or Commodore. 64 or Amiga monitor and you want to hook it up to an old-school CRT television that doesn't have a VGA connector so you can use the video outputs. Now the uh, composite output is not as good as the S-Video. I've done some uh, captures where you can compare the two side by side. So I'm just going to switch over to S-Video and I'll walk you through some of the driver options that become available when you're dealing with the video output. Okay, so now we are connected with the S-Video, so I'm just going to turn it on. Another important thing um, to talk about is the TV standard. I got my card from Germany, so it's outputting in the PAL standard. If you are getting a card from the US, it will very likely be configured to output in in the NTSC standard. So there's a difference in resolutions and refresh rates. PAL has a higher resolution but runs at 50 Hz. NTSC slightly lower resolution but runs at 60 Hz. So I'm just going to switch over to the capture. I've just started recording here and we have a look at the options that we have available. So by right clicking and going into settings and then advanced, then you go to displays and we now have some options here. So it's outputting at 800 by 600 at 50 hertz. So we click the TV button and we can change things like the contrast and the color saturation. We can also uh, change the screen position. So if your image is a little bit off center, you can play around with that make it uh, fit nicely. I'm just going to fix that and put it up a few. There you go. And we've got some uh, sharpness options here. We can make it a little bit sharper or blurrier depending on what you like. You can also make it go to black and white. Um, that's for composite. There's some flicker flicker removal you can play around with and here you can change the TV output. Now I wasn't able to change this to NTSC you can only choose um, PAL options so if you click down here these are all the TV standards you can choose from. Okay so now we have a look at comparing the composite output with S-Video. In general, you always want to go with S-Video. The quality is just uh, a little bit better.
Okay, and finally we're gonna have a look at the video input. So the top RCA connector here is a composite input and I've filmed um, a bit of some outside footage of my garden on this camera. So hopefully I'll be able to play this back through the AV port. So just give me a moment to set all this up. So we have to go to video in this one and hopefully we're getting a picture straight away let's have a look we just got to fill out a few things here there you go so that's already working but I should be able to just play Okay, there it is, that's the video playing. So what can we do? We can make it um, full screen and the quality is, is okay. It could be better, but look, it is composite. But one neat little thing that you can do is if you minimize it, um, you can make it appear on the desktop. So you can do some work um, and have something running in the background. So it could be, could be another gaming console or something or just a video looping or you could have a webcam connected or whatever so what else can you do you can also do some recording here there's a uh, capture button so it now writes it to the hard drive again the quality is fairly uh, average so I'm pretty sure you'll find some better software on a, on a Pentium 3 ma machine like that with a gigahertz you can probably um, find some newer software like a virtual dub um, and get that to go but it is recording so that's all working so it's saving it as an AVI file uh -huh, okay there it is so that's the recording so yeah that worked pretty well okay guys and that was it that was the uh, composite input so quite handy I don't think a lot of standard uh, graphics cards had that feature usually you had to buy one of these all in wonder uh, products with the TV tuner but it's nice that ATI put this on a general on a general gaming card I didn't have much luck with the DVD player now on my other computer the Pentium 4 the DVDs actually play fine, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. I've installed pretty much the same software. I've burnt my own DVD with uh, PowerDirector, and I've also got uh, a DVD that came with uh, some, some product that I bought on eBay, but I keep getting a region code uh, error. I also swapped the DVD drive, um, but it didn't help. So sometimes things don't work out. I was hoping on being able to test some slower processes and see how good the DVD acceleration is but it seems a little bit iffy so sorry guys it's not gonna happen for this video unfortunately and that brings us to the conclusion what do I think of the Rage 128 Pro and should you get one if you're looking at buying a, a retro graphics card for your next PC? In general, I find that most retro builds out there use a 3DFX card or uh, a card from NVIDIA. Sometimes I see a Matrox, but very rarely do I see an, an ATI Rage 128 Pro being used. And um, I can kind of understand where people are coming from. I always choose Intel and, and, and NVIDIA. Those are my go-to brands, but I'm positively surprised with the Rage 128 Pro, and I think you should give it a go if you have the opportunity to pick one up uh, for cheap. So let's talk about the performance. 16-bit colors, if you're playing in 16-bit colors, there are better cards out there. However, in 32-bit colors, performance is actually really good and competitive um, with the other brands. Drivers, very impressed. I did not have a single driver issue. All games worked at all resolutions in 16-bit and in 32-bit colors. I also like that the V-Sync controls are built into the driver and there are some other little, uh, little tweak options that you can change. So good job ATI. Now we do have the benefit of being able to use the latest drivers. So maybe the situation was different back in the day. But if you're building a system now, and you just download the latest driver, you should have very little issues. 
multimedia capabilities, the Rage 128 Pro is feature packed in regards to multimedia, having video, um, having composite and S video outputs as well as composite video input. Now, very handy, the composite output and S video output work without the monitor, without the VGA monitor being plugged in. That means DOS works, the bar screen works, Windows works. So that's really great for doing some capturing. If you can't afford uh, a more expensive HDMI capture card and you want to capture with uh, S video, you can also run dual screens, plug in VGA and use a TV as a secondary monitor. The DVD playback feature did not work for me well on the Pan M3, um, an issue with the region code. Not quite sure what the, uh, what the issue was, if it's software or if it's hardware. I did try a few DVD drives and I set the region code on my drive a few times, but that didn't work, so just be aware of that. Having said that, on the Pan M4, I did not have any issues. Another thing to watch out for if you're looking to buy one of these cards is what version should you get? I went by looking at pictures of old reviews and I wanted to get a card that's as close to the original launch card because what happens often is that ATI is selling OEM cards or cards with reduced memory bus uh, or slower clock rates. So you want to be a little bit careful. Also, if you do pick up an OEM card, you might have issues installing the driver. There's a little workaround. Uh, you basically install the driver and it'll unpack the driver into the C directory slash ATI, and then you manually install the driver through device manager. So there's a little workaround for that. Picture quality is really good. It has a 300 megahertz RAM DAC, and even at high resolutions, the image is crisp and clear. Now, once again, this is for the ATI card that I have. You might get uh, a different version, like from Sapphire or another brand, and they might be not as good as the uh, video card that I reviewed. DOS performance is okay. Now, if you are into Commander Keen and some of these games that use tricks to get smooth scrolling, then this card is not for you. But for the normal, let's say normal, for the average DOS gamer who wants to play Doom, a couple of adventure games, this card will do the job just fine.